This episode is brought to you by The Skeptical Buddha, The Tao of Science. My book, which is a thoughtful discourse on Eastern philosophy and how it helped birth ideas required for science and skepticism and the way it fell behind in the face of new evidence. This book discusses the long history of both philosophies as well as the tenets and variations within the varying sects along with psychology and our own natural biases. It discusses how to counter our natural biases using science and the underlying concepts of meditation and mindfulness, a more complex understanding of how science operates than most of the public understands, and why it is the best tool we have to discover truth and reality, as well as philosophical ideas we might embrace as technology progresses. The material is packaged in a way that the average person can understand with rich illustrations to draw the reader in and feel at peace. Welcome to After School Democracy, the podcast that attempts to fill in the gaps you almost certainly missed in school about politics, economics, and history. So late last year, I watched a video by What If Alt Hist about 12 lies about reality. There is some good stuff in there. However, there are some very shallow assertions about several things I would have probably made the same mistake on just five years ago because history is an incredibly deep and complex topic. But I don't blame him. In both my videos, What If You Found Out You Were Living on Earth 3 and How the CIA Gave America Dissociative Personality Disorder, these videos were made with a ton of research and studies we have solid evidence for and the receipts for from declassified reports and historic documents, but were never taught in many schools and colleges until we recently stopped slowly seeing things through a modernist Eurocentric mindset. But only after we gave up on postmodernism and struck a less biased middle between the two on issues I discuss on Why I Believe in Science video. One way you can distinguish that something is propaganda is that the other side's opinions and ideas are misrepresented, not discussed, or marginalized, and after listening to the Revolutions podcast for the Russian Revolution, I realized I knew nothing about Marx, communism, and socialism and had to do some serious digging. There are a lot of reasons vanguardist socialist nations fell to capitalism or dictatorship starting out with no infrastructure or educated populace or any experience in democracy or civil rights and trying to square the circle of trying to avoid just switching to a permanently capitalist system enacting Trotsky's continual revolution ideas. Also, their systems of government was double direct democracy with poor checks and balances thanks to just coming out of literally the worst civil war in human history and keeping some pretty bad leftovers from monarchism for expedience. Then having Stalin seize power who believed a quack scientist which led to the Holodomor, but all of that is another story in my very, very long series I finished up called What the Heck is Communism? Not a lick of this was ever explained to me, just as racist history was never clearly explained to me in any meaningful manner, and learning about the truth has been painful. Anti-communist propaganda was so strong in the U.S. thanks to the COINTELPRO and the House on Un-American Activities Committee, most of us have no memory of our own communist, socialist, and anarchist movements in the U.S., nor have a clue they are even rationally based arguments arguments that make some sense if you know what they are, but they just told us it's a stupid yet evil idea that always ends in dictatorship where everyone gets the same no matter how hard they work. All of this was kind of true in the most simplest forms in certain situations, but a comical farce compared to the reality of the situation. That said, watch my series, What the Heck is Communism? Here, I'll just go into colonialism. I went into communism not because I definitely believe in it, but because there were so many lies and misrepresentations around what was said and what it stood for. I needed to cover it so that the other side at least gets their argument presented, as most people don't even know what that is. Sadly, because some lefties realize anti-communist propaganda Propaganda as just that, they then wholeheartedly eat up the pro-communist propaganda, once again going back to the, your point that there is no black and white. Moving on to colonialism. The first premises is correct. I mean, I think it was? I don't know. The claim was that the West was already the richest place in the world prior to the age of exploration. He asserts that without any evidence or citation, just in terms of spices and the value of Arabia and the Middle East, was way richer than Europe? While China truly did view themselves as invincible, and there was a real reason why the Chinese mocked and belittled the Europeans prior to the Opium War. But that's another argument entirely. Compared to the Americas, where up to 95% of Americans were wiped out from disease causing the lack of controlled burning, this was most certainly true, and I have no idea about Africa, as prior to the Age of Exploration, most of Western Africa was a Warring States feudal Iron Age kingdom system, just like Europe at the time, so even that is suspect, considering Mansa Musa was listed as one of the richest people who has ever lived in existence, so I'd like to know that source before moving on to that one. That said, they did have 
have a resource advantage. They had started the first industrial revolution not long after the age of exploration, and Africa needed their cheaper products that would have taken artisans, which they traded as captured slaves for, to keep the military edge over their rivals. Many of the slaves themselves were artisans, and the slave trade caused a serious brain drain in Africa. Another reason why Africa needed European products was thanks to equatorial temperatures where nitrogen evaporates out of the soil faster from farming, there was just less people in the region per land. This squeeze from both their warring enemy kingdoms and empires, and the constant brain drain they would do to each other's kingdoms created a literal dumbing down in terms of skills and knowledge of the area, making them less prepared to defend against a full force European invasion. Even then, the Europeans couldn't move into the interior without the help of the Gatling gun steamboats and quinine, which didn't exist until the late 1800s. For more info on this period, check out From Nothing and Home Team History, both are great African history channels on these topics. Now let's move on to claim two. The areas with the least colonial endeavors are now the richest. You're seeing the problem with slavery in general and how it rots society and makes the powerful lazy. This line is true. Germany throughout all the wars was always at a disadvantage and had no choice but to be efficient. It is literally the only way this survived against her colonial power's neighbors and created a culture of efficiency that was literally do or die to maintain. The colonial empires with their own access to the sea always ended up being lazier and wasting resources. If they even remotely came close to German efficiency, they would have crushed the Germans into dust, just like with ancient Rome, because they had a lot of resources and labor to waste, and boy did they ever. This still put Britain and France at the advantage. That said, Scandinavia is not even comparable to any of these because it struck oil in the North Sea and made so much more money and thanks to social democracy was able to avoid the resource curse by dividing it equitably among its populations. That and that alone is why it's now so rich compared to the rest of Europe. You can thank Marx for social democracy as it acknowledges Marx's descriptive critiques of capitalism and uses the government to fill in the holes without giving up capitalism. They are richer than Spain and Portugal, who had much more land. Much of that comes down to how they organize their colonialism. For one thing, Spain brought so much silver from the New World that it crashed their markets as silver was the currency creating mass inflation. On top of that, they did not engage in colonialism the way France and Britain did, and were already relatively weak powers by the time the scramble for Africa occurred, as by that time Britain, not Spain, were the rulers of the seas and their navies. Also, he claims that the parts of Britain and France that industrialized were not those with colonial money. Uh, that's not a coherent argument if you understand the basics of colonialism. Where the heck do you think industrialized areas got their raw goods to manufacture? Yeah, most of them were from colonial areas. So, while they may have not gotten colonial money, they sure as hell got colonial raw materials, much cheaper than if they had gotten them through fair trade. That's the whole mercantile system. We create a colony, we get raw goods, we send them back to our country, and they process them into higher value things. Then we get to his third claim, that after European powers left, large parts of these empires, such as in Africa, saw massive economic declines while the European economy saw massive growth after giving up their colonial powers. Okay, here we get to the heart of the colonial problem, most often out of sight and out of mind of the moderate academic history writers you probably read. And that worked and continues to work great for these richer nations you mentioned. So how did colonization work? Well, it was a hybrid of chattel slavery and a caste system using a divide-and-conquer strategy. During the scramble for Africa, they would divide up the continent based on their own interests and create borders purposely bisecting and lumping together tribes and former kingdoms that had zero loyal to each other. Think gerrymandering, but on an even worse scale. They would take one tribe, usually in a minority, that was good at fighting, and pump them up, claiming they were superior and closer to being like white people because they were good fighters, and then give them all jobs equal to that of enlisted military positions in a regular army. They and the rest of the tribe were trained to be good enough at specific military grunt jobs, but never given any officer-level power or education to ensure they could actually run anything. With this warrior class in power, learning was strictly banned beyond the level of caste they were allowed to have. This basically took Africa from an Iron Age feudal civilization to a caste system with chattel slaves, with Europeans at the top. Congo was the very most extreme example, where King Leopold of Belgium, knowing synthetic rubber was going to replace rubber plants, once it got to an industrial scale in about a decade, pushed the warrior class to be so brutal and efficient to get the most labor out of the natives, they didn't even let them use bullets to kill game. Any bullet 
shot required a human hand to prove that it was used for shooting people. Since there was little oversight in many of the mostly remote areas, there were entire populations without, I believe, their right hands just so that these soldiers could kill game. It was an utter nightmare. He was able to spread out both the chain of responsibility and the chain of dependence enough, like most global capitalist chains, to create a banality of evil and plausible deniability to the rest of the world, and kept them in the dark until enough journalist press uncovered the practices and had enough sufficient evidence to overcome the counter-propaganda from Leopold and his corporation. Even worse than emancipation in the U.S., there were zero plans to help them replace their learned class as Europe pulled out. Nothing. They were on their own, and with centuries of maltreatment by higher caste tribes, they all turned on each other. To this day, these countries, as they are called by the West, still don't view themselves as remotely a unified nation. Politicians go into government to screw over their rival tribes and take care of their own tribes. It's why corruption is so rife. Each member is like a mob boss trying to take care of their own by being as corrupt as humanly possible against the other tribes. The Middle East has suffered similar issues, as we all well know, but not nearly as devastating effect as they didn't have an enforced caste system. There is a reason why many African nations turn to some variation of Marxist-Leninism as it did take a backwards uneducated nation lacking infrastructure to space in 50 years. But since there were fewer caste systems created based on ethnicity, they had much more national unity as the majority were all either peasants or proletariat class regardless of ethnicity. However, colonialism never ended. It's not like we ever left Africa alone, just like we never let black people rise or fall based on their own merit post-slavery. The West actively screwed over and thwarted their growth to get their raw materials. When the Congo was freed, King Leopold III gave a grand speech telling the Congolese that they had been children, and now that as their father nation, they agreed that they were all grown up and ready to become independent. This meant more like teenager independent, with the same access to resources as they had before, just under black management, they never trained on how to actually run anything, other than the rare lucky one able to travel abroad for education, like President Patrice Lumumba, who came out and told the king to F off, and GTFO, of the Congo, a place that should have been the Wakanda of Africa with all its natural resources. Stunned, the Belgians realized that the Congo wasn't going to be their little bitch like they had planned and fomented a rebellion and breakaway region with a leader who would be called the Democratic Republic of Congo. Lumumba asked for help from the West to stop this breakaway region to no avail, so he fell into the trap the Western nations were hoping for, and he turned to the USSR for help, as they were the only other major power, which suddenly marked them as communists just because they wanted to rule their own land. This had the CIA help Belgians nab a democratically elected leader, Patrice Lumumba, and drop him off in enemy territory, where he was executed. We then helped Mubuntu Sesi Seiko, an absolute monster of a man from their warrior class who sold out Lumumba to take over and rule the nation with an iron fist, something the U.S. did constantly with Central America, which is why they're so messed up today in coming to our borders. We would assassinate four other elected heads of state, stage coups to topple many of the other elected governments we didn't like, because they would dare deal with the USSR in a way we didn't like. One of the other reasons why Portugal and Spain are not as rich today from colonialism is from the expanded Monroe Doctrine that Teddy Roosevelt took and ran with where we stage a revolution breaking Panama off from Colombia, then basically making it our own little colony, building the Panama Canal, killing workers in brutal conditions. Basically, once that happened after the Spanish-American War, they stopped messing around as much in their former colonies. We Americans took over for them and then benefited amazingly, especially in sugar and bananas, something you can read about in the book The Banana Wars. When this form of regime change and assassinations became less palatable, especially after the Church Commission, where America was shocked to learn all the mess up stuff we did, though still not to the depth we have 50 years in hindsight with all the documents declassified, we shifted to exploitative trade policies. France kept a tight leash on their former holdings currency and still holds it. This prevented them from going on their own way, and France was able to use this as a tool to keep unfair trade policies toward France to get their raw resources. They also used the IMF, World Bank, and the WTO to saddle them with debt and tear open any trade barriers they may have needed to establish their higher tech 
trade by building wealth and self-sustainability through homegrown stuff like food and textiles, something all poor emerging nations were able to do. All these tariffs were forced to be stripped out of favor of global market forces, which were way less stable so a farmer could lose their farm one year when food prices drop so low it's not even affordable to farm. Then the food prices would spike, creating a famine because no one could afford food on the global economy. This was done on purpose to continue the mercantilistic tradition of raw goods leaving poor areas, they go to rich areas, then are sold back to poorer areas at higher prices instead of ever allowing them to build their own industries for themselves. Even our charity would bring food or clothes in making certain products dirt cheap, killing local industry, killing local jobs, and then when the flood of donations stopped, suddenly they were all broke. The IMF would give loans to nations they knew were corrupt, claiming it was just part of their culture, ensuring they would be in never-ending debt, something that China is now doing with their Belt and Road Initiative, and everyone's losing their crap over. However, Africa is benefiting from because they can now play off the East and the West. And while, under the Europeans, there was infrastructure they built, it was purely in waste to extract resources and take them out of the country instead of where people needed them. At this point in history, thanks to their mucking about so much, there are little to no tariff barriers to trade with the West, but African nations have serious tariffs against each other and little transport infrastructure between each other that it's cheaper to buy from Europe than their neighbors. Luckily for Africa, especially the younger generations are beginning to create national identities out of whole cloth that their parents don't have, thanks to the internet and sports. They are better educated and are coming into politics with a bit more national pride instead of tribal ideology. There is also a pan-African movement to break down these trade barriers and create their own EU-style trade blocks. ECOWAS is one of several trade zones where they are opening up to each other for free trade to dampen the global impacts of the West and working to create a unified currency that will free them of French monetary domination. Once again, I find What If All Hist very traditionally informed from a Western moderate perspective sometimes from a conservative perspective, where only the elites and winners are heard from and the downtrodden have their stories silenced and facts are cherry-picked to make us always the good guy. Five years ago, I would have been nodding along to him, but that is the problem with moderate education and learning. They explain how things are, but never why things are. What are the systems in place by those with power that appear boring to kids in school and keep poverty in place? Yes, Europe got richer because they no longer have to hang on to power through force in Africa. They now use proxy wars, tribal infighting, and trade policies. The lesser educated, higher caste members just see government infrastructure that whites abandon, and corruption and foreign exploitation just continued, but with a black face, and was often run much worse. Once again, this guy is not dumb, but he has a blind spot for an entire chunk of reality I sure didn't know until I did a deep dive into the topic. New Africa is a great channel to learn more about these topics if you're interested. Don't attack them or be a jerk, though. I don't really think my 5,000 followers need to be told that, and any attacks from my viewers would be a drop in the bucket compared to his 240,000 viewers at the time that I wrote this, and he wouldn't even notice. In the abstract, I like a lot of his videos, but some are way too essentialist and ivory tower. In terms of understanding the current reality, as these have been carefully cultivated for the average person to remain ignorant or just blame poor nations for their own problems. These are the kind of TED Talk-like videos, but more concentrated, that I would have eaten up less than five years ago until I started looking for all the history information I could find with deeper and with less Western bias that failed to mention any systemic exploitation. It seems so cartoonishly evil because it really is, but that doesn't make it any less true because it's a system and a chain of dependence called the banality of evil, a concept I have covered in another video. I like the work, but we all need to look into things from the side of the downtrodden instead of just following the modern history written by the winners and realizing that ignoring and misrepresenting their position really is the definition of propaganda. Is their position true? Not sure sometimes. He in a past video denied Churchill's role in the Bengali famine. However, Churchill does does share some blame, though not as much as many would like to believe, for slow action early on and some racist views and policies. It was more local bureaucracies, but he does share some blame. So both are right and wrong, but he is more right in this case, but you have to at least correctly explain the other side's point of view, much like times I take issue with my fellow atheists misrepresenting Islam, or it's just that, not truth, it's propaganda. So as always, thank you all for watching this as a video or listening to this as a podcast, which I'm sure was completely uncontroversial to anyone, especially to the YouTube monetization team. So if you found this useful, please donate to my Patreon.
Just a reminder that I'm Anubis2814 on YouTube, and I have almost 700 videos on my channel that I've made over the past 11 years on religion, science, psychology, and politics. Please go check them out, and if your site has the option, like, rate, review, and comment. A special thanks goes out to Kendall Copperberg, Mylon Mia, Ogrel, Elias Garcia Guevara, and Joe Taylor for their $10 or more Wapawet level donations. I'm always humbled by the fact that they find my work worth funding and worth driving me forward. Thank you all. Please consider donating to my work if you can, and thank you all for listening.